before I introduce Emery Brown, I want to issue a trigger warning. If any of you have surgery scheduled in the next future, you may want to take a coffee break. So the Emory Brown is the professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School, a professor of mechanical engineering and computational neuroscience at MIT, and an anesthesiologist at Mass General Hospital. So here's a question. Depending on your age, you remember Dr. Kildare, or you remember Marcus Welby, or you remember House, or you remember Gray's Anatomy, and the patient would be under anesthesia, and they'd be measuring the blood pressure, and they'd be measuring, you know, the breathing rate. And when Emory thinks about anesthesia, he has a very simple question. What do you suppose we might learn if we study brain activity under anesthesia? <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Juan. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about rethinking anesthesia as a, a missing link in clinical neuroscience, and I think that'll be clear by the, by the time I get through. So here's the case. 250 million people get anesthesia yearly around the world. And believe it or not, most anesthesia is ether-based. Ether was discovered 1846, Mass General Hospital, October 16th. I know it well because we have ether day at, anesthesia, at Mass General Hospital. We all sit around and sniff a little ether. No, no, no. But there's still a number of post-operative problems. I mean, there's poor pain control, brain dysfunction in the elderly, anesthetics are toxic to children. We're very concerned about that. And probably most importantly, we're not using modern neuroscience to actually govern the practice of anesthesia. In fact, in 2007, I got a Pioneer Award from NIH, and a Pioneer Award is for this great idea, which is high risk, high reward. I just said, I'm gonna use neuroscience to study anesthesia. They go, wow, that's amazing. That's a radical idea, right? <laughs> so that's what I wanna talk about today. And just practically speaking, anesthesia research is never part of a philanthropic operation. It's ironic because even at Mass General, where it was started, it's not part of the, it's not part of the, the philanthropic calculus. So let's start with the definition. What is general anesthesia? So it's this drug-induced state in which there's control of pain, drug-induced reversible state, where, and you're also unconscious, we don't, you shouldn't remember what's going on. It's nice if you're not moving around while the surgeon's operating. And we make our money as anesthesiologists maintaining stability and control of the physiological systems. Because see, if you take away that word reversible there, and you have those four states there by themselves, they're synonymous with death, okay? So that, that, that's not good, all right? And the one thing, the point that I wanna make is that everybody loves to say it's not clear how anesthesia works. I'm gonna tell you in two seconds how it works. Leeway mentioned that rhythms are important for the brain to control information transmission. Anesthetics take over control of the brain, they generate oscillations which are outside of the normal range where the brain operates and it makes it difficult for the various parts of the brain to communicate. That's the story, all right? So let me just show you this here in a little video, all right? So this is a lady I took care of about six or seven years ago who's gonna have thyroid surgery. And this is her EEG. And what I'm doing is I'm giving her a bolus of propofol, our most commonly used anesthetic. And what you're going to see are the changes that her brain goes through as she goes under anesthesia. Now you see all that noise there, that's her doing this. She's tensing up because propofol burns when it goes in, right? See, that's her tensing up. That's actually going to be good from a pedagogical standpoint because you're going to see the precise second when the drugs take over. So watch what happens here in about another four seconds, starting right now. Beta oscillations, she's sedated. Now watch these large slow oscillations appear. Boom, she's out, she's unconscious. You'd see her eyes fixed in the midline and she stops breathing right here, all right? And now watch what happens, she goes, to, goes flat and it bursts. So the only other time you would see states like this, these are state coma. Anesthesia is a drug-induced reversible coma, all right? Well, what have we figured out about this? So, the drugs produce oscillations. The oscillations impede how the brain communicates. If you look at them like this, you might be able to see the differences between some of these patterns for some of the drugs. However, if you switch it over into the frequency domain and you look at the spectral content, you can see that every drug, depending upon drug class, has a very, very robust signature that you can readily identify. So there you have propofol there, which has a very strong alpha oscillation and low frequency oscillation. 
Sevoflurane, which is one of our modern day ethers, has a very similar pattern except as a third oscillation, which is a theta oscillation. And then there's ketamine there. And interestingly enough, we're going to have some dis talks in this session or in today, in the next couple of days about ketamine. And so that's the pattern you actually see when someone is sedated. But it's also the pattern you see when, you, when ketamine has been used for its antidepressive purposes as well. And then dexmedetomidine. So drugs have signatures. They change systematically with drug dose. And they change systematically with drug category. What happens with age? Here's a very important part because a high fraction of the patients that we take care of are well over 50 years of age. So here's propofol again, someone who's 30 years of age, right? Here's someone who's 57. You can see exactly the same pattern, the alpha oscillation around 10 hertz and the slow delta oscillation. Now here's a woman I took care of about seven years ago. She's 81 years old. You can see she has the same oscillatory patterns, but they're much weaker. And the practical implication of this is that if you see this on the EEG, it's much easier to dose your drugs so that you can actually keep her in the state that she necessarily requires to be, to be well anesthetized. And so this is a, a lady who I took care of. She had a tumor on her chest the size of an American football. It took the thoracic surgeons the better half of six and a half hours to remove it. And, but I was able to give her one third of the already age adjusted dose because I was using the EEG. Here's the part that's a little bit sobering. These two guys are the same age. The 57-year-old gentleman looks like the 30-year-old gentleman, and the 56-year-old's pattern looks like the 81-year-old's pattern. We age different physically. It's not surprising that our brains, our brains age differently as well. What's wild is that by putting someone under anesthesia, maybe you'd be able to see it. Here are the kids, right? And just empirically, we found that the power turns out to be the highest when kids are around eight years of age. So we can use these ideas to actually tailor the way anesthesia is administered to people in the OR. At the moment, at best, 25% of anesthesiologists use some form of the EEG, certainly not this paradigm that we're talking about. We're working to educate anesthesiologists to do exactly this. And this is just an illustration of it. I put this in. So without monitoring the EEG, I'm giving you some idea of the drug doses you might give someone for propofol, 100, 150 milligrams. With the EEG, I could cut it down to 20 to 30. The wake up in about 10 to 12 minutes, typically, cut that down to two to three. And as opposed to waking up groggy, waking up coherent. So I want to leave you with one final idea. So this is, and I asked one of my rat volunteers to help me show this, all right? <laughs> So, so he's anesthetized with, with, with uh, isoflurane, one of the ethers. And so we don't give you things to wake you up. We just let you come to. So why not turn the brain back on, especially if the brain's not working after anesthesia? So we just gave him an injection of Ritalin, the same Ritalin we use to treat ADHD. Now, now he's got a turnover for this to count, all right? If he doesn't, he's got his feet caught in the wires there. If he doesn't turn over, it doesn't count. He does make it. I've seen the end of the video. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, he made it. Thank God. God. So, so why not give something to turn the brain on, particularly if, in fact, the brain is dysfunctional because of being in these oscillatory states, which are persisted for a long period of time? And the word on the street is that things like Ritalin work because people use it in high-stress jobs. They self-medicate with Ritalin to make their brain sharper. Right? So, Here's what the future looks like. Using EEG-based monitoring and you know, neuroscience principles to guide drug dosing, we can change the practice dramatically. In fact, because the companies that normally produce the monitors were not doing this, we've actually set up our own startup to actually take this on. It's especially important, as I pointed out here, for elderly patients. Intelligent systems would be very straightforward to develop for this because someone who's going to be on, under anesthesia for four to three hours or longer, why not develop a control system that can help you dose the drugs? There, the computer could really help you out you know, tremendously. We're also working on that. Turning the brain back on, I just showed you an example of what that would look like. And repurposing. You know, the, the, the Ritalin is an idea where you could use something which is used in a whole different context. And their <laughs> anesthesiology and pharmacology is replete with these options of things which could help out 
you know, anesthesia. And then moving forward five, five to 10 years, maybe having really site-specific drugs, targets which take into account the circuits and not just essentially the receptors. But here's what I want to leave you with. See, when you take anesthesiology seriously, See how anesthesia is in the center of the universe there, and all of clinical neuroscience rotates around us, right? You know? No, it's, it's really true, right? So, it's like, take for example, like pain, right? Ketamine is used to treat pain, ketamine is used to treat depression, ketamine is a model for schizophrenia. And take a drug like methylhexitol. At low doses, it induces seizure. At higher doses, you can actually use it to treat seizures. Right? So if we take anesthesiology, neuroscience and anesthesia seriously, we can actually improve care for patients who require surgery, but more importantly, we can draw from clinical neuroscience and we can contribute to it. So this is why I say anesthesia is the missing clinical neuroscience link. Thank you.